It's so interesting how to how do you share yourself with people in terms of what would be supportive for you to all to know about me? And um, Susan and I were talking about this via email and what I'm coming to realize is the primacy of relationships in my life and how um, if you really want to know me, oh, welcome. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> If you really want to get to know me, um, you have to know all the people who raised me and loved me up. Um, so I think that's just what I want to share with you just in terms of who I am. Um, I was raised by Trudy Elaine Scott, um, my mama, and my grandmother, Tommy Starnes. Uh, thank you, Lori. And um, I was also raised by my auntie, um, Barbara Scott, who passed a couple of years ago. Um, my ancestral lineage goes through um, Mississippi and Missouri, goes all the way on my father's side to Liberia. And uh, we come from the indigenous peoples of Liberia, the Medingo, it's partly Muslim. Muslim Christian. Um, people who have really helped me sit a little taller are um, Toni Morrison, James Baldwin, Lucille Clifton, Lorraine Hansberry. Did I say August Wilson? If I didn't, I'll say his name again, August Wilson. Um, and then just raised by a whole group of people in the Dharma and too many people to name here. Um, that's just a little bit about me. And Susan and Bill and I were talking and they let me know that you've all been uh, in the terrain of the Four Noble Truths. And this week, really getting to know this first noble truth, which we've all been learning about exploring our entire lives, actually. Um, earlier this week, I was with um, a practitioner who was so clear in her aspirations for her life and her practice. It was so beautiful to witness because um, the strength of her aspiration and the, uh, the connection of her aspiration to her intention of how she wanted to live moment to moment, like it just filled her with so much inner dignity and clarity. It, there's almost a regalness about her. And yet it was really simple. It wasn't this put on regalness, it was just um, an inner dignity that came from this clarity of knowing, like, I want to dedicate my life to what she said, she wanted to be a force of good in the world. It was so beautiful to behold, so beautiful to witness. And I bring this up because I feel like we come to this practice, we come to the Dharma, with very high aspirations and very deep longings for what it is that we long to live into, that we aspire to, um, what we aspire to in our practice. As I look at you, I wonder what some of your, what is it that your heart is longing to live into? Actually, why don't you feel free to if you're feeling called to in this moment, like just unmute yourselves and um, just offer a phrase or a word that's an expression of what it is that your heart longs to live into. What do you aspire to? It may be, I just want to live a life of wisdom. As my um, practitioner friend was saying, I just want to be a force of good in the world. Anybody, you can just unmute yourselves. This is Lydia. 
thank you. I'm so glad to see your face and hear you speak. For me, it would be kindness. Kindness, beautiful. Yeah. I would like to become uh, responsive instead of reactive. I feel you on that one. Responsive <laughs> instead of reactive. Thank you. Is your Regine, is that how you pronounce your name? Regina. Regina, Regina with a hard G. Regina, Regina. Okay, thank you. Pronunciation. <laughs> Regina. Hi. hi, Tom. Hi. Yeah, hi. Uh, I think two words that popped into my mind, maybe <clears throat> just listening to you, were uh, warmth and grace. Warmth yeah. and grace. Yeah. I think you're speaking for a lot of us and what, what we well, what I wish were more um, a part of our public discourse, warmth and grace. Thank you, Tom. Maybe a couple of more. So we've had kindness, um, wanting to be responsive rather than reactive, warmth and grace. I'd like to find self-acceptance. Self-acceptance, yeah. That's a big one, yeah. self-acceptance, yeah. Oh, Lori here has said gratitude and service. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, hi, Don. This is hi. Holly. Um, I would like to say welcoming, acceptance, and tolerance. Mm, welcoming, acceptance, and tolerance. Did I hear that right? Welcoming, yes. acceptance, yes. and tolerance. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you. I would say, uh, for me, peace. Peace, peace. Thank you so much, Corey. Thank you. For me, this is Jennifer. I um, I would say freedom and creativity. Mm, yeah, we can't forget the. Sometimes we can get a little overly serious in our practice, and uh, we forget that there's creativity, fun, joy to, that can just imbue this as we walk towards freedom. Thank you for bringing that in. Freedom and creativity. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, Maybe. thank you. I'm sorry, go. Scott. Scott, hello, Scott. I mean, in connection with that, I would say <clears throat> to know and practice connection. Mm, to know and practice connection. Yeah. yeah, so much of this practice is around relationship and connection. Thank you, Scott. Thank you for bringing that in. Hi, so, I'm Bill. Hi, Bill. I would like to find more abundance. More abundance. Happiness. Happiness, yeah. Thank you. Um, it's so beautiful just to hear these aspirations. I feel like um, so many of us, uh, we're just one big heart naming what we all want, um, connection, gratitude and service, kindness, warmth and grace. Like, these aspirations in, just in my opinion, are what one teacher, Gil Fronsdale calls um, a biological imperative to freedom. And this is what he has to say about that. He said that somehow the depth, the core of what this Dhamma practice is about, it's not up to you. Something's going to be working through you and it's nothing mystical. It's not like coming from outside. It's a potential, a possibility that lives in your own heart this biological imperative to freedom, right? And you've all just been naming this um, movement, this impulse towards uh, acceptance, wisdom, uh, freedom and creativity, connection. I remember um, being at a retreat and one of the teachers saying that this practice is learning to love no matter what. And it had a visible impact on everyone in the retreat. We were in the middle and you could just see that it landed and it kind of reverberated through everyone. And this one yogi raised their hand 
and said, that's a beautiful aspiration, learning to love no matter what, kind of along the lines of what we've all been sharing here. But she said, how do I live into that? How do I like manifest that and realize, realize that in my day-to-day -day life? And the, the poignancy of her question for me was that she recognized that in her question there was this longing, maybe even a, an ache. Because I feel like in asking the question, she was recognizing like there are some obstacles to living into this loving no matter what we have this biological imperative and yet there's this, um, there are these seeming obstacles towards connection, towards living with warmth and grace, towards living with kindness, right? We are such soft, very, very resilient, right? Very strong beings and yet, um, we're vulnerable too. We have these eyes and these ears and this, these noses and tongues and these bodies and hearts that are so sensitive. And they are meant to know. Like our whole being is meant to know through uh, attuning to and resonating with the world of sights and sounds and smells and tastes and sensations of the body and our thoughts and our emotions, not only our own thoughts and emotions, but that of others. And if the world of our senses was all pleasant and pleasure and pleasing, um, this would be a heaven realm, but it's not, it's a dukkha realm. And we, uh, this Duke is such a broad and nuanced thing that we try to approximate with our language. And I know you and Bill and Susan have been exploring, well, what is this Duke thing? Right? I've been thinking about it lately as just this range, this scale. Now, one side can be this very intense, um, physical pain or mental anguish, the anguish of the heart-mind. And on the other side, are, it's just a little discomfort in the body, a little discomfort, a little irritation in the heart-mind, or not quite feeling settled or at ease. And then everything in between, it's just this whole range. But what kind of the common thread through everything that we call dukkha or that we experience as dukkha is that it's the pain of knowing deep down that there's this biological imperative for freedom and that everything that we see, that we hear, that we taste, that we smell, that we think, all of these things cannot yield the lasting satisfaction that we so long for, that, that is the heart's birthright, right? And dukkha, we know it. We know it directly, we know the stress of sexism and racism. We know the stress of blame and loss and sorrow because it lands in our very sensitive, open bodies and nervous systems. And when we, we take in the world through our senses, it's not all pain. Not all the time, but when it does land in the body and the heart mind in a painful way, um, we just want to, there's this tendency to want to avoid, there's this reactivity to just bury our head in the sand or 
overanalyze the dukkha or try to push it away or brace the body against it or just live from the neck up or just try to get aggressive with it or um, try to will our way out of it. All these strategies, all this reactivity towards the truth of dukkha. And that's the other biological imperative, this imperative to uh, avoid pain. And it can feel like this biological imperative to freedom, this biological imperative to avoid pain are at cross purposes with each other, but they don't need to be. They can actually work in harmony together. They can help fuel each other. And for me, what I've been learning is that if I can just allow myself to have an honest, direct encounter with my reactivity toward the truth of dukkha, then just by virtue of, of being with the reactivity and metabolizing it, I come to understand, I come to a deeper understanding of dukkha as not personal. It can feel so personal, but it's just not. I've been carrying this line from Lucille Clifton with me because it's just meant so much to me. Dukkha rolls through our lives and we react as if it's some, um, it's somehow our fault. And the line from this poem is, no failure in us that we hurt like this sometimes. No failure in us that we hurt like this sometimes, like dukkha and the heart's reactivity to it isn't a personal failing. It's just what hearts do, especially hearts that haven't quite come to some deeper understanding of dukkha. And this imperative to avoid pain, it's so innocent. Like, if you're just with the, the bracing against dukkha or wanting to push it away or wanting to hide from it, if you're just with the, the reactivity, you'll see that underneath it is this, I just wanna be happy. Oh, I just want my loved ones to know ease. I just don't wanna see them in pain. Um, it's such a innocent movement of the heart to want to avoid pain, avoid dukkha. So we don't need to make an enemy of our reactivity. We can actually allow ourselves to have an honest, direct encounter with it. And I found that patience has been really supportive in, for me in that way. Um, just calling on this capacity to like be with the utter discomfort of our reactivity and allow, again, just turning to, attuning to, resonating with, and through that process, getting to know it without letting the reactivity breach the boundaries of our heart and move into our words and our actions so that we end up causing undue pain and stress for ourselves and the people we love and people we don't even know. Like patience, this capacity just to be with the, the pain of the dukkha, the pain of um, our reactivity against it, without letting it, again, just as I said, move into our words and our actions. And this is our commitment to being ethical. This is our commitment to um, living with a heart that's ethically attuned, that has this capacity to like uh, ask and know, okay, this will be of benefit for, for Tom. Oh, this like recognizing what'll support my own well-being and Jamie's well-being and Angela's well-being and Dennis's well-being. But the heart has this capacity to just 
know and ask, oh, this will support the health and well-being of not only myself, but all of life. This ethically attuned heart. And when we summon patients to just be with the, the dukkha, our reactivity, we're um, shoring up our commitment not to cause harm. When we, have, when we allow ourselves to have an honest encounter with dukkha, with our own reactivity towards dukkha. So we don't need to make an enemy of it. We can get to know it. And in the process, really um, metabolize it and start to understand these deeper truths of dukkha, that it ain't our fault. It's not a personal failing. These things, uh, dukkha blows through our lives, but we don't need to um, compound it with our own reactivity. And we learn how to do that by actually like having an honest encounter with our reactivity, learning about it without reacting, without um, letting that reactivity sweep us away into actions and saying things that we'll regret later. <laughs>